And uh, we're going to share with you teachings that date about 700 years before Jesus Christ was born. And the teacher, his name was Shakyamuni. His title was Buddha. So misunderstood as so much of religion is. Literalized and completely uh, ignored in most cases by people who don't understand that this voice out of the past was a magnificent psychologist. All of the teachings of Shakyamuni, Buddha's psychology, the fat belly that he's pictured with is simply uh, a symbol of diaphragmatic breathing because the first thing that Buddha would teach is that there's no sense of going into meditation. First, you must diaphragmatically breathe and then expand your, uh, what do they call it? Diaphragm, diaphragm out and uh, bring in air. He said, because the problem with sickness is that shallow breathing does not allow the air to get to the bottom of the lungs and force out, and so people get sick. So he said, if you practice this diaphragmatic breathing, you'll force out all of the <laughs> diseases from the bottom of the lungs. And so he would be pictured with this big fat belly, but uh, was, you know, that was, it's just a symbol as all of this other stuff is a symbol. But what we'll look at today are some of the things that he taught. One of the words that we've, we've approached before is renge, which means the law of cause and effect. You are here because somebody or something in your previous existence or early in your life made a cause, and the effect is you were here. Nothing happens without a cause, and for every cause there's an effect. You live in the state of New Jersey because somebody set the deal for you. You had no choice about it. All of a sudden you found yourself either born here or moved here because of your parents or whomever. There was a cause made, the effect is you live here. So we'll talk about Renge as Buddha shared it, and there's another word that's <coughs> extremely important to our lives and becoming more and more understandable and acceptable in the new age, and the word is karma. What in the world is that? Why am I the way I am? Why are you the way you are? Why do you dream things that you dream of places that you think you've never been, of people that you think you've never met? Why do you experience in your life deja vu? I feel like I've been here. But why do these things happen? And Shakyamuni Buddha said, it's karma. One of the things that's very difficult about Renge and karma is our inability to recollect any of this thing. We don't remember any of it, you know. Your previous lives, all of the experiences that you've had, all of the places that you've been, all of the countries, all of the things that you've done, you remember very little. Every so often you get a glimpse or a deja vu or something, a dream that sparks an interest within yourself as to what and where you were previously, but basically you, you, you have no recollection of this. So you have to look to documents. That's one of the things that Buddha said. He says three things that you have to have. You have to have a document, you have to understand the document, and then you have to be willing to put forth into your life what that document says. So basically, as we started to understand the Bible in a new way, we begin to understand the Bible symbolically and not literally. So therefore we have a document. We're Western people, we're here, we have a document. We begin to understand the document. And then the question is, are we willing to put what the document says into effect in our lives? And if we do, we look at strange things like the scripture that Al found this morning. And then we look at this scripture about our previous existence. Did you exist before? Were you, were you somewhere before? Take a look with me on page 623 in those little Bibles. And let us look at something that's very interesting. When we look at karma, we look at the possibility of a previous existence. And in the book of Jeremiah, on page 623 in your little Bibles, if you look at the very first chapter of Jeremiah, and uh, in verse 5, there is something there that's really interesting. Before I formed you in the belly, I knew you, and before you came out of the womb, I sanctified. Before I formed you, before you were formed in your mother's womb, I knew you. Who is I? I is the eternal personality of consciousness. As Jesus said, I and the Father are one. Does not mean him, because Jesus said, of my own self, I can do nothing. What he said was, I and the Father are one. So, and that's what you've got to understand. You've got to understand that the I, the name of God is I am, that which is the eternal mind, that which is eternal consciousness, that which is the universal creative consciousness is God, and it's in you and it's in every individual, in every living thing that moves and breathes upon this planet. 
And, and, and instantly you can understand then, if this is the case, why it is that God is omniscient and omnipresent. How come God can hear everything that's ever said and know everything that's ever thought? Because God is mind, and mind is in every human being. And so every thought is recorded in mind, every voice comes out of mind, so then God can hear everything and knows everything because God is mind. And once you begin then to pay attention to your mind, and raise yourself above the lower mind, which is the flesh mind, up into the higher mind, which is the divine mind, then you begin to understand you are indeed God. Not the lower personality, but your higher divine presence becomes one with God. We had an interesting study Sunday night, and I wish as many people had been here Sunday night to hear that as we're here Sunday morning for you know Easter bonnets and all that stuff. And that basically was Helena Blavatsky's discussion that when you take off the mask of Satan, do you see the face of God? Is Satan and God the same person? Well, of course, that's, that's enough to get all the born-agains up on the highway to grab their stones and go looking for the guy in the blue suit, you know, bang, bang, you know. Wow, what a heretical thing, what a terrible thing to say. But it's not, say. Because begin, if you really study this, you understand what Satan is simply the negative balance that is so important to go hand in hand with the positive balance. Electricity is a beautiful thing, but unless you have a negative along with the positive, you can't have it. You see? And there's an interesting part in the scripture that Blav Blav Blavatsky taught us last week. <laughs> and the interesting part of the scripture was there was a point in the Bible where it says, and Satan rose up and told David, number Israel. And David did it and then repented for this sin. And then we went to another chapter where it says, and God rose up and told David, number Israel. The same voice, the same instructions. Then, of course, in the book of Job, when the sons of God assembled before, who was there? Satan. And who was the only one that God talked to? Satan. And what did God do? He took everything that Job had and he entrusted it. And he didn't entrust it to the Pope. He didn't entrust it to an evangelist. He didn't entrust it to a preacher. He didn't entrust it to a bishop. He entrusted everything that Job had into the hands of Satan. Interesting. And so when we begin really to look intelligently and maturely at this, we find there is no man running around with a red soup. There is no bad evil. Of course, it says, that, well, I'll show you this. But the basic is that we are looking at a natural phenomena of life. There is a positive. There is a negative. And the negative has been called Satan. And Christianity has turned it into a man. Just like we got Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny and they got Satan and all of this. Excuse the expression, crap that they've been, you know, hallucinating people with all of these years, instead of understanding the reality of what life is, the negative aspects that are obstinate to part of life, which is just as crucial, and you can't live without. So here then, when we talk about renge and karma, and we're talking about pre-existence, we start to say, my God, you know, even though I don't remember this, maybe I did exist before. Maybe some of the reason that the way I am as I am is because of a previous existence and things that I've overcome. Say. For instance, you may get a, a, a snort on you. You may get on a train. You may be up in New York and you get on a train. You know, and I go, where do you want? I'm, I'm going to Florida. Well, you get on the wrong train and you go wind up in Pennsylvania. Where's some town in Pennsylvania? Lancaster, Pennsylvania. You wind up there. Then you don't remember even getting on the train. But the cause was you got on a train in New York. The effect was you wound up in the foothills of Pennsylvania. And it's beautiful. But you don't know how you, and you don't remember at all. The fact is it doesn't require you to remember. It doesn't require you to have any ideas whatsoever. The fact is a cause was put into motion and the effect followed. Your memory about it has, so do you see, what's the difference to you? What the heck do you care if you, when you die in this body, your, your spirit runs off, gets into another body, and you go on and you lift something. It'll still be you. It'll always be you. And forever and ever, it'll always be you in some different experience. You might wind up being the president. Ooh, you might wind up. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of things that you can do. But you, and you'll never remember any of it. But you didn't even remember your dream last night. And you dreamed about 13 times. You don't remember it doesn't make any difference. It happened anyhow. It doesn't require your memory. 
you're going to experience the effect. Let me show you something in the Bible so that because if I say something, you know, most of you don't believe it. I found that to be true. <laughs> it requires me, because I'm a little bit radical and a little bit revolutionary, it requires me to get some document to show you what I'm talking about. So let me do that. Go to page 567 <coughs> in your little Bibles and look at the book of Ecclesiastes, okay, which is more psychology. Because in this way, you can open the book and you can look yourself and see, you know, that guy might not be as weird as we thought. Maybe, maybe he does know what the heck he's talking about. What does it say in Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 11? Now watch this very carefully. There is no remembrance of former things. Neither shall there be any remembrance of things that are to come with those that shall come after. In other words, God is saying, it's none of your business what you did before. I'm worried about what you're doing now. And I'm not going to pollute your mind with reminding you that you were an Egyptian prince. You might have been a jockey on a horse, and you might have been a God knows what. It is none of your business. Because the, the essence of nature is saying, what did you learn? See, and I will allow you to go into your new body and carry with you the things you learned. And eventually, you will graduate from this magnificent life college and go on to that which we call nirvana or that which is the essence of, of heaven itself. See, what? Now, you can't do that. You know the better. And this is your opportunity. No, no, no. Come on, you have to. Oh, you have to because you have this opportunity. Look who's here. Just happened that she had. It's Nurse Joan. You know what? Hey, hey, you know what? You get a kick at it. We got a letter from a guy in New York from Staten Island or someplace, and he says, I love the tapes, and they love seeing me and Nurse Schultz. <laughs> She said, who's Nurse Schultz? She thought you were talking about you. I did not. You did so. I did not. Come on. Okay, now. Is it hot in here? Yes, it is. Turn the air conditioner on. It's those lights. It's the lights. Turn the air conditioner. I can feel it. It's the lights. Go ahead. It doesn't feel hot when I'm sitting down. Well, what do you want to say? Okay, it's just in Ecclesiastes 1.9. It says, the thing that, that hath been, it is that which shall be, and that which is done is that which shall be done, and there is no new thing under the sun. There is no new thing under the sun. This is exactly right. Sometimes, you know, <clears throat> do you ever see these politicians? You know, they say, we want to get moving forward. We want New Jersey to move forward, or we want to move forward, or you're getting a job. And we, you know what moving forward is? This is moving forward. You move forward, and then you move forward, and you move forward, and you move forward. <laughs> That's exactly what it is. There is no new thing under the sun. What has happened is happening. What will happen again and as whatever she said there. It goes on and on and on. But see, such is renge, such is karma in your life. And you cannot escape the effect of the cause. The way you are now is because of what was placed into you as a child or in a previous existence. There is nothing you can do to stop that. But this is what Buddha says. You can't change the effect of the cause, but you can change the causes right now. You can make new causes. Because Buddha said something else. The way you are now is because of what was put into you before. And the way you're going to be in the future is because of the causes that are being made in you now. Sorry. See, many who believe in karma, especially in the, in the Hindu countries, they'll look at some poor wretch in the street. Well, he's just serving out his <coughs> sentence of karma for the things he did. And there's nothing. So they, they had this caste system. You don't touch anybody, you know, and it's miserable. And, and, and Christians aren't a whole lot different. They say, well, you reap what you sow. If you reap to the flesh, you sow to the flesh, you reap to the flesh. And you reap what you sow, and you get what you ask for. But Shakyamuni Buddha says, no. You don't study the reason. You don't study the, the purpose. You don't study what this person did. You don't even look at that. You set about to make that person as happy as you possibly can and disregard anything about karma, disregard anything about why the person is like that. You do what you can to relieve the suffering and make that person happy. That's the voice of the person that Christianity says, oh, you got to stay away from. There is a question down here. Yes. Bill, I just want to add, wouldn't that also affect genetics? 
Absolutely. What is the, how does the Bible phrase it when it talks about genetics? I will strike down to the third and fourth generation. Sure. Uh, uh, somebody can have a sexual experience, can, and can, can, can pick up a, a, a syphilis type of disease, and the, the germ can lodge in the, 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 the brain for, for years and years and years, and then all of a sudden, in another conception, it can bang, come full force. Either the person can start having mental troubles or can put into creation through uh, uh, another sexual experience somebody who is afflicted with a, a disease of whatever. Seth, definitely. And it's all cause and effect. And your, your parents, my parents, everybody have made, you're making causes for those of you who have children. You're making causes for your children. And these causes are going to have effects on those children for years. And, and God knows when they'll happen. What Buddha says is every cause filters in and hides in the subconscious realm of what is called Ku, K-U, waiting for a stimulus. And when the proper stimulus comes, then that cause manifests itself into key. As uh, Carl Jung said, you may place into the subconscious of a little child this feeling of worthlessness, this feeling of not being wanted, this feeling of being less than anybody else. And that hides in coup in the deep recesses of the subconscious until a stimulus of whatever it may be years and years later, and now you've got a rapist or a serial killer on your hands. Yes? Bill, when, when Al just said that, you know, with the genetics, might it mean not what you would pass down to your children, but you in your next lifetime or your next lifetime, might it mean that? I don't understand it. Not, not passing it down genetically, but like what you do in this lifetime is what's going to happen to you in ne your next lifetime. That's very true. Yeah. Hey, you know, there's a lot of interesting things. I've always thought that the perfect way that uh, nature has to train us is if we, you know, if we're a member of the Ku Klux Klan, then in our next life we'll be born black. If, we, if we're black and we, we have a, a hate against what, next time you'll be born white. If you're proud to be Irish, the next time you'll be born in Tel Aviv. I mean, uh, you know, <laughs> nature has a way. Uh, we, that's right, we have a chance of cleaning up all of this stuff. And that's what Buddha's talking about. See, what did Jesus say? Jesus and Christianity are completely different. Jesus Christ said, love and judge not. And Christianity, the religion that takes his name, is just filled of judgmental people. The whole thing is a judgment. The whole thing. I saw people on, did you watch, I don't know how many of you saw Phil Donahue's show the other day. Phil Donahue, there's a group of people who are trying to get Phil Donahue off the air because of the fact that he has some sexually oriented people. You know, he has people about children who are raped and women who are subjected to bizarre things and all of the, and these people don't want it. So they had a Catholic priest and a, and a fundamentalist and they've gotten General Mills to drop sponsorship of the show because of, and this Catholic priest said, Mr. Donahue, let me say, what about the children who watch this program? Are you comfortable? Can you be comfortable with them watching a program like this? And he said, yes, because it's true. But I would have loved to have gotten up there. And I would love to have taken the Bible that they shoved. And I says, are you comfortable with telling a little child about this good, holy man who did nothing to anybody, who was ripped open by religious people, who was stripped and beat about the back and had a crown of thorns shoved in his head, was nailed on a cross and had a spear thrown in his side because you're God couldn't figure out any other way to forgive people. Are you comfortable with that? Are you comfortable? Are you comfortable with the fact that it says in your holy book that a woman should be taken to the gate and have a gynecological examination, and if she flunks it, we will call the men of the town out to stone her? Are you comfortable with giving your little children that to take to Sunday school? There is nothing that, when this is interpreted literally, there is nothing more pornographic or violent that's ever been written in the pages of history than in the Bible. But they'll look at a man who is trying to alert you and me as to the bizarre things that are going on, and who do you have that want people to have their heads stuck in this? You know why they put stained glass on their windows? So they can't see what the heck's going on outside. But what are the practical steps then to help people? What are the practical steps that Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ was not one of them, Jesus Christ was one of us, 
Jesus Christ said, when you see the man with the pitcher of water, uh, the sign of Aquarius. And Jesus Christ said about the churches, he said, oh, they said, what wonderful churches. He said, there's not going to be one rock left standing upon the other. Jesus Christ was a revolutionary and a radical. And what did he say? He said, you are the light of the world. The kingdom of God is within you. Not that you're a worthless sinner like they've tried to make it. He said, you are special. Jesus Christ never came to this planet to show the world how great he was. He came here to show the world how great you are, what your potential is. And that's why I can follow him off the ends of the earth, but I won't follow a Christianity down a block. And so what did he say? Let's look at it real quick. And I won't do a lot of Bible study, but just real quick. Page 782, Matthew 6. Matthew chapter 6, page 782, <clears throat> verse 33. Seek first the kingdom of God. That's what Jesus Christ said. The first thing you've got to do is seek the kingdom of God. That's what he wanted. He didn't tell you to go to church. He didn't tell you to get saved. He didn't tell you to sing songs or read the Bible. He says he wants you to seek the kingdom of God. So you've got a right to say, well, where the heck should I look for it? And he comes right back on page 853 page 853, and he tells you right where to look for it, okay? Luke 17, verse 21, neither shall they say it's here or there. The kingdom of God is within you. What did Jesus say? What did Buddha say? What did Krishna say? Seek within yourself. See? And when you try, to find out what's wrong with me, what's wrong with my world, what's wrong with my life, what's wrong with my children, what about my family, what about the country, what about the world? You see, you're looking for the key. What the heck opens the door so I can understand life? I'm not just here to read books about somebody else, say prayers that somebody else wrote, sing songs, that's, write, read books that somebody I'm here to find out what in the world am I doing on this planet? What's this planet in the middle of the universe for? And what's the key? And what does Jesus Christ say? And this is the last one, page 847. It's, not, it's only a couple of pages back from where you are. Luke 11, chapter 11, verse 52. He's talking about Bible scholars who interpret the law, called them lawyers in those days. You taken away the key of knowledge. Why? You entered not in yourselves. And them that were entering in you hindered. <clears throat> I'm going to need water. Then that were entering in you hindered. So you say, well, other people may remain ignorant. It doesn't make any difference if they don't understand the things you do. Our job is to relieve suffering and to help and to bring people up to the, to the understanding of this. OK? OK, good. Thank you. There it goes, a little that so. A little for the rug. Whoa! Yeah. You know, you know what Shakyamuni Buddha said? And I want you to think of this as next Thanksgiving comes around. Do I put it in here? Shakyamuni, you ought to write this down. You ought to have this on your refrigerator when you have your car, your Thanksgiving turkey next year, because this is what Buddha said 700, 800 years before Jesus was born. You cannot be truly content when others are in misery. You cannot be truly content when others are in, you know what the worst thing was? You have no place to put this down. Yeah. <laughs> mm. That's all right. You cannot truly be, what is hard to accept for many people though, and this is what I want to get to you, is let's take a look at this and see, you know, what about a little child that's born, a little baby that's born into suffering, whatever, maybe it's a physical suffering. A, 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 and, and, and it's a how you're filled with compassion. And who is going to say to you, well, the little child was born sick or in this trouble, but it's because of a previous existence. I mean, this little innocent baby made the causes. It's awful grotesque, isn't it, to even think of that. Innocence, purity, the little child. All you can feel is compassion. There are three explanations. <clears throat> One, the suffering is the will of God. Two, the suffering is chance. And you know what? Most people believe that. It just happened. I mean, you know, these things happen. Or three, the suffering is karma. 
That's the three chins. If one is born in agony and, and, and lives out their life in agony, and it's the will of God, then all you can do is yell, and many people do, about a God. Don't you, don't, haven't you many times seen, why the hell is there a God who will allow this thing to happen? Where is God? That this thing could happen. Something like this could happen. And, and then you think, where, you know, is there no mercy on the part of God? I mean, that he just allows this? And then you look at something very strange in the Bible. I want to show you it. Go to page 609, and you may want to circle this one because this is very interesting. It's Isaiah chapter 45. Right? You there? Okay, look at verse 7. I form the light. You'll see that? And create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all things these things. What's this all about? I don't want, I know these folks have to leave, I don't want anybody running out of here not understanding that. Okay? See this electricity? In the hands of people who know how to use the power, it's wonderful. In my hands, it'll burn the building down. It's not evil of itself. It's a power. But once it reaches you, it depends if you know how to use it. If you know how to use it, it's good. If you don't, it's evil. That's what means I create good and make evil. Create a power, say. Because though God is love, there's only one. See, a lot of times you, you hear this stuff, and this is why Blavatsky is right about God, uh, Satan and, he, and God being the same person. There is only one power. A lot of times you'll see, like, Christians especially, they'll, they'll, they'll harp on this you got to watch out for the power of the devil or the power of evil or you'll fall under demonic powers and all of this power and power crap and they get so frightened and everybody else gets so frightened. But I want to show you something. Go to page 928 and keep this with you whenever you're assaulted by one of those people. And go to Romans chapter 13. The Apostle Paul says something. And he talks about the higher realms of consciousness as opposed to the lower realms of consciousness. And he says in, Revel in Romans chapter 13, Verse 1, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Say, ha, Jesus Christ died. This is the will of God. Then all of those that killed them were acting in the will of God. And everybody that was trying to save them was the Antichrist, right? Think of these things and try, to, and try to sort them out and try to understand them as you go along. But this is what's being said. But so here, we still will dwell with the fact that Psalm 89 says, I will sing of the mercy of the Lord forever. If there is a God that will, will that a little child suffers, then that's unacceptable. So I am marking this as unacceptable. That's unacceptable. God does not will that any little child suffers. It's not, it's not acceptable. Does everybody agree? Raise your hand if you agree. They all agree. Oh, there's a few here that don't agree. Now, what about luck? What about chance? If it's just chance, just luck, then all you can do is go into a depression and swing out on everybody because, you know, what the heck are you going to do? You're going to vent your anger. And that's the cause of much violence and murder, isn't it? So who's to blame? We, we've said this is unacceptable. If, there's, if it's just chance, then the, the question is, you know, there's no rhyme or reason to anything. Everything, you know, it's funny because it's not just chance that the, the leaves are starting to come out on the trees now. Something happened. There's a cause. There's an effect. Is the leaves going to come out? And, 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 and they're going to go away, and then they're going to come out again? Huh? And, and the little rabbits are going to get born, and all of these things are going to happen, and flowers are going to come up, grass is going to come up, and all of these things are going to happen. And there's no luck about it. There's no chance about it. It's all programmed, so luck doesn't figure into it, and it's not the will of God in any way, shape, or form. What this is boiling down to, ladies and gentlemen, that the cause of all of this stuff that goes on in this world is not the devil, which Christian, it's you and me. You and me. We are allowed to use this magnificent planet Earth for better or for worse. 
If it's, if it's God, you can't blame God. You can't do anything about it. If it's luck, how do you change that? Who knows? But if it's karma, then life and God offer you a perpetual chance of bettering your situation from this moment on. You may have set all of the rotten causes. You may have caused all of these terrible things. And yes, the little deformed child could be born as a result of something that happened within the family tree a hundred years ago. Somebody did something they shouldn't have done, and something entered into the genetics, and it looked for a time to be stimulated, and everything has a cause. There is no chance. There is no divine creator who is causing anybody heartache. Anybody. There is something that is placed into you and into me, and when it is ready to explode, it explodes. But it has been put there. So how do we eliminate this? We do what... Jesus Christ said to do, seeking the kingdom, and all of these things will be added to us, and we will receive salvation from what? From bad karma. We will be saved out of bad karma. So Shaky Muni say actions produce consequences, but they can be altered. See, you, I don't have any way of proving this. I can't prove anything. I stand up here week after week, and I can't prove a blasted thing. Yes, I can. <laughs> yes, I can. You know what's so good about this? It's just the opposite. It's because you can prove it. Huh? It's because when, when Jacob says in Genesis 32, 30, I have seen the God face to face and I will call this place pineal. I can prove to you about the pineal gland of the brain. <laughs> Scientists have discovered it. When it says that in the tribe of light, the tribe of Judah, there was 186,400, I can prove to you that's the speed of light per second. Huh? When Jesus goes on the cross in the tomb three days and three nights, is born on December the 25th, rises up at the spring equinox, I can prove that that's the movement of the sun because the sun is crucified on the constellation Crooks on December the 21st, sits in the bowels of the earth December 22nd, 23rd, and 24th, which is the solstice, is born on December the 25th, 30 days later enters into the water of Aquarius and rises up in the spring equinox to the Lamb of God, which takes away the winter of the world and sits at the right hand and summer comes. I can prove all of that. I can prove that Jesus is the sun god because Jesus calls himself Amen, which is Amen, Ra, the Egyptian sun god. I can prove it all. And you know what? If religion is worth its salt, you should be able to walk out in your backyard and prove the whole blasted thing with nature because nature and God is true. And the only religion that really exists that counts and that means anything is nature. Eh? And what have we done with it? We've abused the animals and we've abused nature itself. And when we've done that, we've abused the very essence of God. This is what Buddha said. Meditation and chanting Nam Myoho Renge Kyo will elevate your basic life condition and start to make good causes. Now, <clears throat> I want to give you one of the very few quotes of Shakyamuni Buddha, which have been preserved for almost 3,000 years. This is what he envisioned. Listen, little streams come together to form the great ocean. Tiny particles of dust come together to form the great mountain. When I first take my medication, a meditation, I am like a single drop of water or a single particle of dust. But later, when two people, three people, 10 people, 10,000 people, billions of people come to recite the sutra and take meditation and transmit it to others, then they will form a mountain of enlightenment and a great ocean of nirvana. So you may go home and you, you, you say, well, gee, I meditate, but there's still hell. But those people will eventually see it and find it, and then that little drop of water will turn into a little puddle in your house, and eventually you'll share it down the street, and the puddle will turn into a stream, and the stream will turn into a river, and the river will turn into an ocean of nirvana. And that's what will save the planet and change the planet Earth into the planet heaven as it was intended. There is no heaven anyplace else. It's right here. It's the most magnificent jewel in the universe. Right here and you live on it. And what have we done with it? Drop bombs on it. And after we drop bombs on it, we sang songs. God bless. Eh? Jeez. So you are innately free. And I'm wrapping this up right now. And this is what Buddha says. 
Yes, you inherit a karmic background from other existences, but you are completely free to act in this world and alter that karma starting today. You decide. As Joshua said, choose this day whom you will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And remember, in Luke 11:52, Jesus Christ says, you take away the key. If you refuse that, if you commit yourself to the same route, knowing that there's an alternative, you have exercised the choice. You've put into motion your own free will. You don't have to do this. You can stand there and say, this guy's a nut. You can stand there and say, this guy's a, a cult or whatever you want to say. That's your choice. There's nothing I can do about it. But you, Jesus Christ, his wisdom is known by her children. You've seen the results. Why do they have to have a, a, why do they have to have a drug outreach center in every town in the United States? Why? Why is the second leading of killer of teenagers suicide? Why? Why do they have to spend? Look what they're doing in this bizarre place over there where they're just bombing and bombing and they're carrying little kids out in pieces. Why? For what? You know why? Because religion. Because they don't like the Muslims. It's always religion. And it started out from the very essence of it when this doggone guy, Constantine, formed that one other faith. And he said, in this side conquers. And he took 100,000 guys over it and slaughtered a whole town and set up the, the faith. It's always violence. Their God is violent. Their God isn't the God of pussycats and roses and streams. Their God is the God of vengeful Armageddon's and nailing people to crosses and slaughtering people. And when the God that they worship is that way, the people take license to say that's the way we are and they will fight. But I love the song that we sing here every so often in which the guy says, the words hit my mind and they fall to the floor. If God's on your side, then he'll stop the next one. I want to just tell you one thing. Your karmic tendency has pushed you, but it has not determined your choice. You have. And Jesus Christ said in Luke 6, 46, let's not say what he said. Let's look at what he said. Let's Luke 6, 46, page 838. Jesus Christ asked this whole world a question. Because he told you to meditate. He told you to practice the single eye. He said to cast your energy to the right side. And Jesus Christ says in Luke 6, chapter 46, And why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things which I say to do? Huh? Praise the Lord. Thank you very much for sharing this time with Shakyamuni Buddha. And it was good to have you. And good to be able to share the teachings of such a voice from the past who should be the voice of the present. And just the mere fact that Christianity tells you to stay away from this voice must make you think, why? And what are they afraid that you may hear? And simply what they're afraid you may hear is that indeed the kingdom of God is in you. And once you find out that God is in you, why do you need them? And so much for the institution. Thanks. See you later. Bye-bye.